Hello, I'm sat here in front of our cordon apples. Now when we were renovating the garden um, last year, I decided to remove three of these. Um, we did have nine, we've now got six. I don't know why, but the, the three at this end weren't doing too well. They'd been quite badly bothered by woolly aphids and they weren't cropping very well. They were very nice varieties, but, but they didn't seem to enjoy the conditions here. So we've taken those out and I've had a delivery that includes three replacements. Now it's not a big job to replant some cordon apples or pears, but there is a potential problem and it's something that's referred to as replant disease. Now that's not a specific disease as such, but an umbrella term that, that sort of captures a, a range of problems that can occur when you try to replant a tree in a position that, which has already had that tree growing for some years. There are some pests and diseases that um, can cause problems on a wide range of different plants but there are also many that are quite specific either to a plant family or to a genus or some other or some other grouping and they affect they affect um, plants within that within that group now apples along with the rest of the palm fruits and the stone fruits and many of the soft fruits such as strawberries and raspberries they're all members of the rose family and I, I don't grow roses myself, but um, I understand that they are notorious for replant disease. So if you've, if you've taken out an old rose and you stick a new one in its place, chances are it's not going to thrive and it may, even, it may even die. Now I've not had to replant any fruit trees, but it's something I've read a lot about and I am a little bit concerned about how the replacements are going to do here. So when you plant, say, an apple tree into a piece of ground that hasn't before held members of that same family, the rose family, you're going to be putting that into a piece of ground that is effectively clean. It won't have those, um, in large numbers, those pathogens that uh, specifically affect apples or, or other members of the, the same family. And your young tree will hopefully establish quite well and as it grows um, those pests and diseases those organisms that can cause problems for the apple will eventually take up residence now that now that their preferred host plant is in place they will colonize that that area and it's not a big problem for your new tree because by the time those, those, those pests, those pathogens have built up to um, levels where they could be quite harmful, that tree has already established itself quite well. So it will have a good root system, it's probably already got a nice network of mycorrhizal fungi, and it's now, it's now robust enough to cope with the, the, the slightly hostile environment that it now has in that soil. If you take that mature plant out and then stick a young one in, it is instantly placed into an environment that could be rather hostile and it doesn't have the benefit of an established root system of, of that network of, of mycorrhizal fungi or, or any, anything else that that would help it through. So the young plant is very susceptible to a variety of problems when you replant it and that's really what replant disease is all about. So replant disease doesn't refer to any one particular root cause but a wide range of, of potential issues that you might experience when replanting. Now that can cause your, your new plant to um, well, fail to thrive and, and quite possibly not establish at all. Now I don't, I don't know just how serious it would be if I just put the replacement plants in this ground without taking any measures to combat the replant disease.
it is quite a difficult thing to deal with, but there are a few things that might help. Something that's often recommended, but is not very practical, is to plant somewhere else. Now sometimes that might be possible. If it's a, if it's a rose bush, you, you may be there's somewhere else in your garden that you could put your new plant whilst, whilst leaving the, the previous site for, for something else. But when we're talking about fruit trees, very often there aren't any alternatives. You might not have room in your garden for a, a fruit tree anywhere else. Uh, if it's in an orchard, you want to replant in the orchard and, 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 and not the field next door. In my case, I've got a row of cordons here and I've got six trees that I want to keep. I can't, and I can't move that row of cordons. There's nowhere else for them to go. So in this case, I have to replant into this soil if I want to have the, these apple cordons back. So another option is to change some of the soil and I could have and perhaps should have dug some of the soil out and swapped it with another part of the garden where fruit trees haven't been growing. And that might have helped quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure how practical it is in this particular location to um, change the soil. I've got quite a narrow bed that the cordons are planted in and then the roots will spread out underneath the pathways and, and into other parts of the garden. Um, and I really can't access those. So I could have I could have removed the soil in the location where the, the plant will, will go in, its, in, in the first instance, but not where the roots will try to spread um, um, quite soon. So I haven't done that, but, but there are still a few other things that can help. So typically when you remove a tree or a large shrub, the soil that's left behind is somewhat impoverished. Even if you've been applying regular mulches, that soil's not going to be great and it's beneficial for your new tree to give it that um, a good start by replenishing the soil, rejuvenating it by applying plenty of organic matter. So as soon as these trees were removed we applied a very thick layer of horse compost, um, about six inches and uh, that Hopefully, as a lot of that has been worked in by now. That was, um, that was back in the summer. So the worms and other soil organisms have got to work on that. And that compost should be, um, hopefully, rejuvenating the soil nicely. Another thing you can do is to change the soil pH. So lots of organisms are sensitive to the acidity or alkalinity of the soil. And if you change the soil pH, you tend to change the balance of organisms in the soil. So the soil here is on the acidic side. Um, and I will apply some lime. I will probably fork some lime into the planting hole. And I will also top dress with lime after I finish the planting. And that may have some beneficial effect. And the final thing you can try is to add mycorrhizal fungi. Now I talked about these on the video where I was planting cherry trees. And essentially um, they form a symbiotic relationship with their host plants. And in fact, the vast majority of plants have such a relationship with um, fungi in the soil. Um, from the host plant, they extract carbohydrates that the fungi can't photosynthesize, so they take their carbohydrates from the, from the roots of the, the host plant. But in return, they offer um, water and nutrients, and effectively they form what can be quite a large um, secondary root system. And that is very beneficial for the plant in question. Now you don't normally have to worry about adding these things to your soil because they exist in nature. Um, but it is often recommended when planting trees to add some to, to give them that head start. And it's a particularly common recommendation for replant disease. So I will definitely be adding mycorrhizal fungi. So when planting a cordon you need to provide some sort of support that's typically in the form of wires tensioned with straining bolts or 
barrel strainers or, or something of that nature. Now those wires can be fixed with vine eyes. Um, you, can get, you can get the type of vine eyes that will fix to a wall or, or those that can be screwed into wooden posts. So we've got ours against a system of posts and wires. Um, we've got four inch softwood posts and we've got three wires attached to those. Um, we've also got a horizontal bar that runs along the top of those support posts and that's actually proved to be quite handy in the past for, for tying up branches that might be rather overladen with a crop that, that could potentially um, cause the branch to break or in supporting the, the, the cordon itself. Um, these cordons are all planted at 45 degrees or, or something around that. I think they've probably sagged a little bit. And if you're planting vertically, it's not such a problem, but if you're planting at 45 degrees, there is, there is quite a weight of the, the, the branch and, and then especially when it's laden with fruit, there is quite a weight trying to drag that down. And, and the top bar, is very handy for um, strapping the supporting canes. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut three bamboo canes. We've got a we've got a rampaging bamboo plant in the garden, and it produces some whopping canes. So um, rather than buying some or using some some skinny canes, I'm going to I'm going to cut down four substantial um, branches of that and and use those. So I will insert those into the ground and tie those in with, well, with tie wraps to the three horizontal wires. And I'll also put a strap to that top bar that will really hold that, that cane um, quite securely. When I plant the replacement trees, I will then tie the, the main stem into that cane. That's much better than tying to the wires. For a start, it helps keep everything straight. And also, you don't really want the wires rubbing directly against the stem. They will wear through the, through the outer bark quite, quite quickly, and, and that's, that's not ideal. So I've uh, cut some fairly substantial pieces of bamboo here, which I'm going to use um, for tying in the trees. And I've got some heavy-duty tie wraps to fix those to the wires and also at the top to the um, horizontal rail we've put in place. Now these wires are three millimeter galvanized steel. You can use stainless and at some point of course these will start to rust and I need to replace them but they should have a reasonable life out here and at one end we've got some barrel strainers where we can keep these keep these nice and tight. So the spacing for the cordons is horizontally three feet. Now they can be planted a bit closer together, but I, I think about three feet horizontally is ideal if you're putting the cordons down at an angle. And that leaves a couple of feet between the, between the parallel stems. So I'm just gonna measure out the right place to put the first cane. Now these trees have got quite, quite substantial, or at least some of them have, and so they're probably leaning a bit further than the 45 degrees they were originally planted at. So I might have to give this first one just a little bit of space, but of course there's, there's little to no growth coming out of the bottom of these trees because all the light is, of course, coming from the top and the, and the side. I'm just ramming these just about as far as I can push them into the ground. I 
and then I'll clip them in place. I'll just do them lightly to start with and then I can adjust their position in a minute to make sure everything is spaced just as I want it. So I'm just going to take a look at this one and get the angle right and then I can measure across and set these other two correctly. If I look at the point where that cane entered the soil, which is about there, uh, I'm not far off now. Well, I've got about 35 inches actually there and top of the soil, I've got about 36 here. So this is this is close enough. I think I will leave that one there and then drop these accordingly. So you won't always have a, a rail like this above your posts. Um, it's not entirely conventional. Usually you'll just have the, the posts and, and the wires and that's fine. But I can't remember why we put this up here originally. Um, these have been replaced as part of the renovations and I'm, I'm working on the replacement posts for the pair cordons now, but um, I, I don't remember what motivated me to put a rail like this on top of the post, but I'm glad I did because over the years I found it quite handy. And it's very good for hold, holding these canes really, really tightly in place. It doesn't matter too much when you first plant, even a, even a thin cane is absolutely fine. But later on it's quite nice to have something with a bit of strength to it. Well, it's not perfect, but I think it's close enough for training some trees. So I'm going to tighten up these straps and I will cut the excess of these off. Now to unpack some trees. So I've already had a delivery of trees from Keeper's Nursery this year. This package has come from RV Roger and along with some trees I've also got five blueberries and at the back here a Japanese wineberry. Now all of those are pot grown so I'm not in any hurry to plant them. I'll try and get them into the fruit cage fairly soon but there's no rush and these can sit there while I deal with the bare root plants which are much more important. So this is fairly typical for a bundle of bare root trees. They arrive in something um, vaguely resembling a body bag and in here this one has been packed full of straw to protect them and hopefully I'll find some good trees in here. Well, when this package arrived, um, it arrived two days ago and you've got a few days to deal with it. Um, what I did was open the package, made sure that everything looked okay and then I also dampened the straw so that, so that the roots won't be drying out and this has then just been kept in the, in the shed for a couple of days. The weather was pretty grim the last two days high winds and lots of rain, rather stormy so not ideal for getting out here and planting. But they should be perfectly fine kept in the shed for a couple of days at least. 
If you can't get to your planting site um, after a couple of days, it's probably best to, to heal them in. Um, I did put up a video about healing in trees recently and you can put them in the ground but if you, if you can't get into the ground then you could take a, a large container and put them in there and cover that with just damp soil and that would probably be fine as well and then store them in a, a frost free shed or garage until you can get to them. Right. So along with, along with a wrapping of straw, they've got a piece of batten here to keep everything straight and in good order. Now I've got a bit of a mixed bag here. I've got some trees and I've also got, I should have some currants and, ah yes, there are the gooseberries. I can see the spines already. Right, well we won't know until they're teased apart but there looks like some reasonable fibrous root there. Quite happy so far. Actually this is a particularly good looking gooseberry. So this gooseberry is early sulphur and here I've got Lancashire lad and this one looks particularly good. Yeah, that's got the makings of a great bush. I'm sure this one will develop fine as well, in due course. Nasty spiny things though they are. I'll keep them out of the way. And this is a red currant, it's phase prolific. Yeah, this, this red currant would always be on my list of fruits for a fruit cage. I, I really like this variety. It's an old one from America. It dates back to the latter half of the 1800s but it's it produces really great fruit. Um, this has been started in the traditional way for a red currant with a with a clear leg on it. Very often now you find them um, with with sort of a stall um, like you would have for a black currant and that's not quite how they ought to be. This is this is kind of the traditional form for a, a red currant bush so that's good. And there should be one more currant. Ah. This one I'm really excited about. In fact of all the trees and bushes we've got, this one I think for me is the most exciting. It's called Bar Le Duc and it's named for a commune in I think northeastern France and they've been producing a white currant and, and now a, a red currant jelly there that is is rather famous. They've been doing it since the 1300 so this one is named for that white currant that they grow and this has a has a history going back hundreds of years and that jelly is rather strange because they remove all the seeds from the fruit individually. Historically that was done with a sharpened goose quill Quite a crazy idea really, very labour intensive and, and therefore very expensive. But they, they pierce the side of the fruit and um, with great dexterity remove the seeds without causing too much damage to the, to the fruit itself. And then that whole fruit is then, is then preserved. So that, that is quite a process and it's something they've been doing for, for hundreds of years. And what I really like about gardening is, is being able to grab hold of uh, a piece of history like that and to grow, the, grow a fruit that's been, been grown for so long and, and appreciated for it, its flavour for that many years. And uh, that's something I particularly like, so many of the varieties that I grow will be older sorts. 
I mean, there are, there are merits, of course, to modern varieties. They've been bred for quite useful purposes for uh, improved frost, frost tolerance or resistance to diseases, and those are all worthy things. Um, plant breeding didn't stop being useful in the 1800s or the 1700s. It's just that, for me personally, what I like to grow in, in our garden are those lots of those older sorts that, that have some history and some story behind them. But yeah, I'm very excited about this one. Okay, so this is one of the apples. Um, this one is Margill. That's an old apple. It's a bit, I suppose you could describe it as being somewhat cox-like or maybe a little bit like the Ribston Pippin. Um, but yeah, it's a young little fella, but um, it's going to do fine for what I want it for. Some nice buds up here. Sometimes you might have to think about shortening the main stem on planting to encourage bud break lower down, but there are so many buds that are clearly breaking down here that I won't need to do it for that one. Right, this is Ashmead's kernel, and that is a great apple. Sort of a pear drop flavour to it, very aromatic, very nice. Now this was one of the varieties we had there, but that tree was in a bit of a bad way, so I'm hoping I can keep this one in a better state. This is not an apple, this is a cherry, and this is May Duke. Now I'm planning to fan train that, so I will, this one doesn't have any useful feathers on it, so I will have to cut that back somewhere, somewhere here and take some side shoots, but I can't do that until after bud break. So that's one I'm gonna to have to heal in for at least a few days until I can get round to it. Um, this one is an apricot, this is Hemskirk. Yeah, and the same thing applies here. I will be fan training this, so this, this growth at the top is not very helpful. What I can't see on this one, though, are any particularly useful buds. But I'm sure when I, when I head that, something useful will emerge. I hope so. Um, yeah, that's okay. And this should be the final apple. And yeah, I think. Apologies, there's an enormous flock of geese flying over. We're surrounded by lakes here, so we do get some interruption from the wildlife. So this is, or it should be, pitmast and pineapple. Yeah, this is pitmast and pineapple. That's, um, that's a lovely little apple. And it has that particular sort of aromatic flavor. And that's where it got the name pineapple. And yeah, this will, this will do nicely, I think. Good. So I'll go and get those planted, but before I do, I will just take care of the, the roots on these I've removed. I'll cover them with some of this damp straw until I can get back to them and heal them in temporarily. So the planting order for these trees is somewhat arbitrary and um, the only difference between them is that the first two will only be a single stem and the one at the end if it happens to produce some suitable side shoots you can take them off at an angle to fill out the the triangle of what would otherwise be wasted space at the end of the row um, I've done something similar with the other end of the row on the apples here and also also on the pears and and it's nice just to fill those in so that you don't just leave a, 
a gap of wasted space for the last one. So I think for that one I'm going to put Margill. If I had more of any of these three varieties I think I would probably prefer to have the heavier crop on Margill. Right, so the first one is Ashmead's kernel. So I'm going to excavate a hole there. I'm then going to sprinkle in some lime. Now, I know this bucket says fish blood and bone, but what I've got is some granules of lime, and I will put some of those in the planting hole. I will mix those in with the soil, and I will then, once I've positioned the the root ball there, I will sprinkle that with the mycorrhizal fungi. I decided that for just three trees, it's probably not worth me mixing that stuff up as a, as a dip. Um, then I think, I think I will fill that back. And once I've planted all three trees, I'll also sprinkle a bit more lime across the surface. And hopefully those precautions might help um, relieve this issue of replant disease. Now, two things to bear in mind when, when planting trees. I mean, the first is that you want to follow the old soil mark. So if I, sh if I bring this closer to the camera, you can see that there's a dark mark here. This is where the, the top of the soil was when this, this was in the ground. And you want to stick to that as close as possible when you replant. Also, for anything you're planting at an angle, you want to look for the position of the graft union. And that wants to be uppermost. So, in this case, that, that is the orientation I'm looking to plant this in, with the graft union on top. That way it's um, stronger than if it's on the bottom. But apart from that, it's just like planting any other tree. This, so this soil is quite easy to work here, of course, because we've already disturbed it earlier when we uh, took the old trees out and also when we got lots of this compost on. There are still signs of the compost here, um, but quite a lot of it seems to have been worked into the soil already, which is good to see. And there are lots of worms in here, which is another good sign. That I don't want. That's an acorn. Not the right tree for this spot. Right. See what else needs to come out. So that's all right there. Okay. Right. Time for some lime, I think. You want to leave a little bit of space between the, uh, the main trunk down the bottom and the, the wires or the fence or whatever you've got these growing against to leave some room for the trunk to expand. It doesn't take that long for them to get to this sort of size. So you don't want to plant too tight there. Well, I think the level's right and I think the position is pretty good. One final thing to uh, make sure of is that the graft union is, is well clear of the soil level. Um, sometimes that, that can be tricky if, they, if they've grafted rather low down when you're, when you're laying the stem down. That, that graft union can get rather close to the, the top of the soil and you want to avoid that where possible because the uh, scion may well then root down into the soil and you lose whatever dwarfing effect that you were enjoying from that, from that rootstock. Now for the fungi. Well, 
I tend to give these a, a gentle tap. Um, sometimes I will firm them in just very gently with, with my foot, but I don't like to do too much stomping around. I think that probably does as much harm as good. So what I will do in a moment after I've planted all these is give them a good watering, not because they really need a drink, but to wash the soil down around the roots and settle them in. And that's the way I like to plant the trees. It's, um, it's the way my dad taught me to do it and makes sense to me. So I can see the old soil mark is um, just there at the surface of the soil now. So that is pretty much spot on. I dare say the roots will run into this bed, which is not something I'll be particularly happy with, but they go where they go. I've got um, some pots with their bottoms cut out around the fence for, for planting other trees in, um, with the hope that that will prevent their roots from coming straight out into the veg beds and, and interfering with any planting. But that can't be helped. They will go here wherever they go. In the previous arrangement, there was a path here, so this wasn't this wasn't cultivated this spot, and so those it didn't matter what those roots were up to. But it's slightly different in the renovated layout. Okay. So now for some water. I don't think I need to water these too much. By the look of it, we're going to get rained on pretty soon. Well, these little fellas aren't going to need much support for, for quite a while yet, but I will put a couple of ties on here to hold them in place. And though I don't like to use too much plastic in the garden, I do like this stuff for, for tying in. It's, um, it's some tubular material and it's, it's quite stretchy. And I will leave these ties fairly loose, but even so, if you, if you leave one and, and it, it starts to get tight, it won't, it won't girdle the stem because this material has got quite a lot of give in it. And I think, I think for tying in fruit trees, this stuff is actually pretty handy. The other thing I will do is I will tie first to the cane and if it was a wire I would do exactly the same. A couple of turns around that and, and a knot on this side before I then go around the, the stem of the, the tree. And that puts some of this soft material between the, between the bark of the, the tree and the cane or, or the wire. In some places I'm tying in against wires and I really don't want wire rubbing against, uh, rubbing against bark and, and causing damage there. Um, that is a good way to end up with problems with, with canker and such things. So there's plenty of space there for this stem to expand. I'm not going to have to worry about retying that for, for a year or so. And uh, it'll give it just enough support when it needs it. Well, that job's done now. And I'm just going to top dress with a little bit more lime and then go and heal in those other plants, the gooseberries, currants, and other trees that came in that package. I may get to them soon, possibly even tomorrow, but just in case I don't, they've already been hanging around for a couple of days. I don't want those roots to dry out, so I'm going to get them in the end of the fruit cage where 
the foil was worked not that long ago so it should be nice and, and loose and quite easy just to drop them in there. I'm hoping these three trees will survive and perhaps even thrive. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they do given that we've already had um, quite well established cordons here before. I am a bit concerned about it but at the same time hopeful that with the uh, plenty of organic matter that's been piled into the soil, the uh, addition of a little bit of lime and the mycorrhizal fungi, that that will be enough to get these off to a good start. Now the clouds are gathering and it looks like we're going to get some rain quite soon, so I better get a move on. So from me, it's bye for now.